All right. Well, welcome everybody. It is 4.52 on a beautiful Thursday afternoon, the 2nd of April, uh, 2020. And here we are again, day drinking with Wes Hagen. So um, as folks uh, come on in, I'm gonna be checking the streams as I always do at the very beginning. This uh, camera right here is going to be pointing towards the Wes Hagen Facebook page. That camera is uh, on the Jay Wilkes uh, Wine Santa Barbara Facebook page. Demi, you win. You're number one. Hurry, we're alone in this room. Let's say something weird. Uh, Tammy, I will be right back. I'm just going to go check on my Facebook and uh, welcome Bill and welcome uh, Mikhail as well as Bob. Uh, remember the folks that I'm pointing at over here on the West Hagen Facebook page, you might want to go over to the Jay Wilkes Wine Santa Barbara Facebook page. It is a commercial Facebook page and thus has um, better streaming and it is prioritized in the streaming. Uh, that's for you and John and Terry as well. So come on over and join uh, Tammy and I. Santa Barbara, if you're so inclined, if you're happy watching this, uh, that's all well and good too. And welcome, JD. I'm going to check the, uh, make sure we're looking good, and I will be right back. All right, as my friend Dave Vergari says, we are live and we are nationwide. So let's settle in, relax, take a deep breath, understand that we're in, uh, in an interesting historical time and thank goodness we have uh, wine, beer, spirits, mead. I won't include seltzers, sorry seltzer, you just, you haven't uh, matriculated yet to be important to this world. Uh, and Dominic is back. He was hoping he was going to make it. And I got your yeast question, uh, Dominic, and I think I sent you that. Uh, it wasn't running as of two minutes ago at the Jay Wilk site. I did just go check in, and it should be on about a 30-second delay. So I'm actually looking at the Jay Wilkes Santa Barbara. Remember, it's not the Jay Wilk site. It's Jay Wilkes Wines Santa Barbara. It's our, it's our tasting room site. Um, we are in the process of removing the original Jay Wilkes Facebook page and focusing everything on the Jay Wilkes Wines Santa Barbara. Carrie, welcome. Missing the hitching post, I really am. Uh, one of the most important restaurants in my estimation uh, in all of Santa Barbara. And Anne is here. Uh, Bob and John came on over. All right, Bob, very well. All right, is, is it wrong that I have a glass of smashed berry rosé and one glass in the hand, uh, one hand in the, no, no, I believe in uh, very strongly that, uh, that dual wielding uh, or, or double fisting is absolutely perfectly appropriate, especially in this um, sort of uh, uh, unknown time where we don't know. I, you know, the way I look at it, you know, two hands, two glasses, it seems to make sense. I try not to argue uh, with, uh, with evolution by natural selection. Um, we have two. We have two hands. Just in case we lose one, we can still drink. And if that doesn't work, we'll figure out. That's what straws are for. You know, that's what that's what permanent straws are for. Because we all know that those paper straws that we've been getting don't work all that well. So my wife and I have now purchased uh, permanent straws. I, I guess, I guess our our uh, our hippie history uh, dies hard. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Your wine is poured, and Dominic is ready. Today we are going to be doing in about three minutes. We are going to be digging in, and I will show all of you early uh, early committers. Now, this is another reason why I like that camera and not this camera. This camera goes to Wes Hagen, Facebook. That camera over there, according to you, goes to Facebook page. This one, um, little the quality of the picture isn't quite as good. The quality over there is a little bit better, uh, and it's also in more high definition, which might not help looking at this, but you will be able to better read uh, these wine labels, especially because this one actually thinks about it and uh, flips the image so you can see uh, it uh, turned right the way. So if I point that way, it's really weird because if I point that way, anyways, it's, it's a little confusing. But in a two minutes, we're going to be cracking that wine, and we're going to get... Um, a little day drinking go. Not that I'm cheating. It does take a lot of beer to make wine. 
and uh, you know, and beer being so important to the history of the world. Uh, in the next two minutes before we break up in the Ballard Lane, I will explain to you how beer mistakenly gave us a way for science to beat this virus. Beer is responsible for the solution to COVID virus. And it's clearly true. Um, after uh, um, Lewin Hook had uh, created his compound microscope uh, from lens technology that was developed in the 15th and 16th century in Middleburg, Netherlands, these lenses were, uh, lens technology was going off in the Netherlands. And if you wanted the best lenses in the world, you would go to a Middleburg, Middleburg in Zealand, Zealand in Holland, in Netherlands. Um, Old Zealand, I guess you could call it. So in Zealand, they had such amazing lens grinders that these lens grinders during their free time, they would practice and make various prototypes. And uh, the, both of the prototypes for the uh, modern uh, microscope both developed in just a decade of each other in Middleburg, Netherlands. It's pretty amazing to think that both microscopy and cosmology were both basically invented in one village in Europe. It just shows that with the right conditions, the right uh, focus on science and the right materials, uh, humans can do almost anything. So once Lewin Hook took the prototype of the microscope and turned it into the compound microscope, enabling all modern microscopy, um, about 150 years later, a guy named uh, Johannes Gutenberg, you know, Let's forget about Gutenberg for a sec. Let's talk about Louis Pasteur. 1850s, 1860s, started using Lewin Hook's microscope. What was he interested in? Milk? Nah, nah. You know, uh, um, Pasteur didn't care about milk. He loved beer. Go, Pasteur. So what ends up happening is Pasteur wants to write a book uh, call on fermentation science uh, called Beer, Its Diseases, and How to Prevent Them. So he starts using Lewin Hook's microscope. Eddie, we're talking about beer. Uh, and hey, Phil, it's good to see you. Um, or good to be seen. Um, so uh, using Lewin Hook's microscope, Louis Pasteur developed, looked at beer and tried to figure out why beer actually went bad. And what he saw, he named under the microscope, he saw little tiny micro microbes moving around. And as the, one of the world's first microbe hunters, he got to name them. So he, he named them germs. So in an attempt to understand why beer goes bad, to understand the kinetics of fermentation, for the first time a human being using the genius of human discernment understands how fermentation works from a scientific basis. 1860, the world believed that alcohol was created by a god or gods for human enjoyment. It's a lovely sentiment that le bon du fait le vin, you know, the good god makes the wine which makes me wonder if you're an atheist, you know, do you, and it's a good vintage. Do you, well, anyways, but the idea here is that science lens technology, basically glasses, because that's why they were grinding all these lenses. Cause uh, uh, Johannes Gutenberg figured out uh, how, how to make movable type. The middle class in Europe started buying books. They realized how awful their, their site was and they needed spectacles. Well, spectacles have been around 100 years before the printing press, but no one used them except monks because they were the only ones who were literate and the only ones who needed them to make the illuminated uh, manuscripts and such. So what ends up happening is the wine press, which, Lewin, which uh, Johannes Gutenberg used to make the printing press, printing lens technology led to the microscope. Microscope led to an understanding of the microbial universe and the understanding of germ theory. Germ theory is the basis for all clinical medicine in the world today. Thereby, if there is a solution to COVID-19, it comes from the study of fermentation. It comes from the study of beer. So is there anything, you know, go back to Homer Simpson, beer being the cause of and the solution to all the world's problems, that could not be more technically accurate as of right now. Because without the study of beer, we would not have had germ theory. Without germ theory, we wouldn't have modern medicine. And without beer, we'd be all stuck in our houses wondering, how much wine we have. So we have plenty of wine, we have plenty of beer, maybe we have some spirits, uh, you know, I always like to say I drink beer standing up, wine at table with food, spirits between table and the floor, table and bed, depending on, uh, you know, what's going on that day. But how exciting is it that if we have a scientific solution to the problem we're in, which I strongly believe we do, and that science is gonna win this thing, that that science all comes from the study 
of beer. Welcome to Day Drinking with Wes Hagen. It is 5.02. Um, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I'm seeing uh, Peter Rogers just came, came in. Uh, we've got a bunch of other people ready to rock and roll. So let's jump in. And um, I will, uh, and I said I think this last night, I am keeping up with your questions on these, but I have not yet posted the two-week calendar. And I commit to you right now because, and I'll, under, I'll explain to you why, I will not be doing a video tomorrow night, but I will be watching a video hopefully with you. And I'll explain what's up with that. And then we're going to have our um, open Zoom hangout on Saturday, which was really fun. We had like a dozen people um, hang out on Sunday and everyone was on Zoom and everyone was talking and I was kind of moderating and we were looking about what we were tasting and people were talking about food. We had restaurateurs. We had winemakers, we had wine salespeople. It was loads of fun. So Saturday at five, we're all going to get together on Zoom, and uh, I will put the link probably on Facebook, and I'll probably um, bring it into the Santa or the Jay Wilkes Facebook page. Eventually, this will disappear from the Wes Hagen Facebook page. So do make sure that you've liked and that you follow the Jay Wilkes Wine Santa Barbara page because eventually. Uh, the other, this one, will actually go. Hey, hey, Cheryl McPhillips. I'm guessing that actually might be Mark. So my friend Mark McPhillips in Sierra Madre, California, otherwise known as Wes's Hotel when he's working in uh, Los Angeles. They have a guest room tucked in the beautiful foothills of Sierra Madre where they allow me to, uh, allow me to stay when I'm uh, in the greater Los Angeles area. And uh, I've known Mark McPhillips since I was 16 or 17 years old. So that's a... That's a 34 year uh, relationship that's still, uh, that's still going strong. So Cheryl, Mark, Colleen, it's good to see you guys. Awesome. All right, we're ready, let's do it. Boom, Ballard Lane Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, I did a lot of research on Cabernet because we talked about Cabernet uh, last week with uh, the Barrel Burner. And the Barrel Burner is 100% Paso Robles uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. This is actually blended from the Central Coast, but almost all of these grapes are from Paso Robles and almost all these grapes are from our estate vineyards within the Paso Robles Highlands District. Now, how many percent of Cabernet Sauvignon grapes are required to be in this bottle for us to be able to say it's Cabernet Sauvignon on the label? Anyone know? Anyone want to give it a guess? I'm sure someone's typing right now. We got a little bit of lag. Anyways, the uh, has to be 75% Cabernet Sauvignon by volume uh, for it to be, uh, oh, nice. And Tonino, you actually spelled restaurateur correctly. That is the most, I know it's not a common word, but of all words in the English language, restaurateur is, mo is the most often misspelled word in the English language. There's no N in restaurateur. Yeah, so I mean, I am an English major. I have a very fancy English degree from the University of Redlands. So if I can't at least pronounce restaurateur correctly or say microscopy, um, liberal arts education is really good for Jeopardy and dinner parties. And damn it, I am gonna go on Jeopardy and really hope that fermentation science uh, and English literature, um, especially British modernism, pop up over and over. Um, ding, ding, ding. Who was Joseph Conrad? Ding, 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 ding. What is Cabernet Sauvignon? See, I've got it going on. Here we go. All right, Cabernet Sauvignon. So we have got 77% Cabernet Sauvignon. So it makes the cut in the state of California by 2%. 77% Cabernet Sauvignon, 20% Merlot, and then the last 3% is Cabernet Franc. What would each one of them bring to, the, bring to it? Well, obviously the Cabernet, Big Mac, Milkshake, French Fry. There's a reason red grape. It is the king of red grapes. I like to say Pinot Noir is the queen. Pinot Noir tends to be a little more sensual uh, and uh, elegant. Cabernet tends to be a little more masculine and kind of bop you over the head. But 70 is going to give this wine muscle. It's going to give it tannin. It's going to give it structure. It's going to give it mouthfeel, depth, density, uh, and of course, Cabernet Sauvignon is one of the easiest grapes to grow in the world because of uh, the thickness of its skins, which also minimizes the juice. Now, if you think about the skin of the grape, as the skin gets thicker, the juice is minimized, which means higher skin to juice ratio. 
And the higher the skin to juice ratio, the darker, richer, and more concentrated the wine becomes. So we do want small berries with minimal amounts of juice. Now, you're saying minimal amounts of juice. That means minimal amounts of wine, damn it, Wes. What are you talking about? Come on, let's, let's make more wine. And can we lose a little concentration and get twice the wine? Well, I mean, that's kind of what Merlot does. Merlot has larger bar berries, or spe especially like Grenache. If you look at a Grenache berry, you know, it could be pretty, it could be the size of the, you know, top part of my thumb. Now, Pinot Noir berry might be the size of my pinky nail if it's a large berry. Uh, Cabernet is probably so, <laughs> careful which uh, finger I show you. Um, Cabernet would sort of be in the middle. So the berries tend to be very sm uh, fairly small. So we do get a lot of, uh, of the um, phenolic and polyphenolic compounds, all of the uh, richness that comes from between the outer skin and the inner skin of the grape, where there's all these vacuoles which contain all of the uh, flavors that make red wine beautiful. Damn it, let's drink. All right, so remember, we're opening a screw cap. We're doing it from the collar. Hold the collar, give it a crack, pop the top, don't cut yourself, all well and good. Oh, that's a good sound on a Thursday afternoon. All right, here we go. I'm getting much better at this each time. You'll notice uh, from the first times, I have actually put a towel over my uh, window so I'm not in um, a stream of light that constantly is making me, uh, the light. nice thing about that light originally though was it shed a really cool sort of ability to show the exact color of the wine. All right, so we can kind of get a good color on that. We are, um, I am uh, swirling my wine. Why to look pretentious? Yeah, but no, actually there's a real reason that we swirl wine and that is to excite the wine on a molecular basis, get it up on the uh, glass, on the side of the glass, and as it begins to settle, that wine goes into a vapor phase as it basically um, comes off the surface tension of the glass. And the more we beat the wine up, it's sort of like you can't smell gasoline, but you can smell the esters of gasoline or the, the aroma of gasoline, the, uh, the volatility of gasoline. And what we're trying to do is make this wine volatile so, and Gary, welcome, buddy. Um, we're making the wine volatile, so when we put our nose in the glass, it gives us a really nice indication and a whiff of what's happening in the wine. So we're exciting the wine on a molecular basis, getting it all nice and um, set in a vapor phase in the bowl. Sometimes if you have a clean hand, it doesn't smell like anything, you can even put your hand over the bowl, which even concentrates the vapors even more because they can't escape. Classic Cabernet aroma. You've got that uh, black current, which is currently, I mean, <laughs> which is currently actually showing really, really strongly. So you've got the current, the black current, um, and of course the uh, cherry, black cherry, uh, uh, you know, some, some um, uh, blackberry, boysenberry. Those are the things that we're going to imagine that we're going to uh, smell in, uh, in a Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, remember now, Cabernet Sauvignon is the world's grape. It is the grape that gets more people excited and more people pissed off at the international style. There is a belief in the world of wine that, that Cabernet Sauvignon is, to a certain extent, a colonizer. And what do I mean by a colonizer? Well, I mean, a lot of people look in, in the third world and even maybe even in the second world, look at Cabernet a little like a British guy wearing a pith helmet. Well, what are you doing here? Are you going to displace our traditional feral grapes? You know, are you going to come in and remove the grapes that we grow traditionally so we can put something in the ground that sells? And this is the biggest problem of wine. If you're going to plant wine in Virginia, are you going to plant Norton or are you going to plant Cut Cab Franc? I'm going to argue you can make a better wine from Norton, but the Cab Franc will sell because it has a French name. Norton doesn't have the cachet, it doesn't have the sexiness, unless you really know Norton and you know just how darn good that grape can be. Um, you know, like I had a client that, you know, I didn't actually charge him to consult. This was back when I just gave it away for free. But he wanted to uh, farm uh, Pinot Noir in Kentucky. And I told him perhaps the terroir was not as willing as it would be in other places in the world. That was as nice as I could be, right? Um, he says, no, I got a mule, not, not the 
fancy, you know, a mechanized mule that goes 80, you know, 60 miles an hour on a farm. No, he had a mule, like half a horse, half a horse uh, and half a donkey. Uh, he had a, he had a sterile, he had a sterile blend is what he had. Um, 50, 50 blend. So you could still call it a mule legally. So he wanted to grow Pinot Noir in Kentucky. And I just told him that he was insane, that that was probably not the greatest, greatest way uh, of, uh, of doing what they wanted to do. But in the end he tried it and he made some wine and it wasn't very good. So he grafted it over to something else, but colonizers, colonizers is where we were going. So, if you are in the um, Chianti region and you're seeing Sangiovese being pulled out and Cabernet and Merlot and Syrah put in so you can make bigger wines than your Chianti Classico to make a wine that um, appeals more to Robert Parker's palate, appeals more maybe to Antonio Galloni or, or appeals more to the wine enthusiast to get a higher scores and then so they can they can sell more wine and charge more money for it so cabernet is a colonizer it moves into places it is grown in the okanagan valley in, in british columbia it is grown in chile it is grown obviously in bordeaux it's grown throughout france it's grown in italy it's grown in greece um it's grown in lebanon so when you, uh, when you start thinking about a grape that is in British Columbia and in Lebanon, that's a grape that's got some traction. That's a grape that's, got, that's, that's getting some work in for sure. Katie's back and Marla, welcome guys. So nice to have you here with us. We're talking a little bit about Cabernet Sauvignon. I have got this beautiful Ballard Lane Cabernet Sauvignon 2017 in my glass. By the way, this wine has two gold medals. Is a gold medal better than 90 points? I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to tell you why. You get four professional wine judges together on any given wine professionally for almost 25 years. Usually you have a winemaker, someone who sells wine, maybe a wine marketer, and maybe a wine writer. If you can get all four of those human beings to say in front of each other in a social situation that they think it's a gold medal wine, that's almost a miracle. I would probably say a gold medal to me from any uh, good wine competition means more than a 90 point score. But what are these wine competitions doing now that they understand that the point scores might actually be more valuable than a medal? Well, now they're actually attaching numbers to their gold medals. So if you give the wine a gold medal, they also say, all right, well, score the wines with numbers. And if it, the number is over 90 points, it gets a gold medal. Or if you give the gold uh, wine a gold medal, also give it a number score so we can publish the, uh, the mean uh, average of, of, the, of the scores in the panel. So here you got it. Hey, Susan. It's good to see you. So now you've got the Ballard Lane Cabernet Sauvignon. And I have talked a lot about this wine without actually tasting it. I said in the nose, it's classic Cabernet blend. Remember, that has got some Merlot. It's got a little Cab Franc. So the Cabernet Sauvignon is going to be the muscle. It's going to be the base of the wine. It's going to be the structure of the wine. It's going to be the spine of the wine. It's going to be the presence of the wine. It's going to be, and because we have named it Cabernet Sauvignon, it's sort of like it has to taste like Cab. It's like it's an action movie. So there's going to be some action. There might be some romance. You know, there, there might be some alcohol use. But damn it, the movie better be uh, what we, uh, what we uh, advertise it as. So here we go. Smells a lot like Paso Cab to me. I could uh, easily mistake it uh, for anywhere in California. Uh, that would not be a cool region. I would not mistake it for a Monterey Cabernet, which is famous for its sort of greenness and celeriness. This one has really nice, big, balanced fruit without being jammy. Um, a, a taste a decent amount of tannin, even though it's 20% Merlot. So Merlot is going to give it a little plushness. When I'm drinking Merlot, I'm looking for plum. I'm looking for a little bit of tannin, but not quite as harsh of a tannin as I would expect in, uh, in, um, in Cabernet. So with the Merlot blend, it should give it some softness and the Cabernet Franc, even at 3%, should give it a little bit of spice and a little bit of complexity. What is complexity in wine? I use the word complexity whenever I can't come up with everything I wanna say. 
If I smell it and there's a lot going on and I'm confounded, instead of being confounded, I say, damn, that wine is, it's, it's very complex. Um, you know, again, what I'm trying to do is deconstruct this wine in describing it. The question is, do I want to drink it? And as I, as I smell it, I, I really do. I like to say there's one ultimate rubric for quality in wine with you. And I've never been have anyone be able to argue themselves out of this and welcome Linda and Kelly's back. Hi Kelly. Put 10 bottles of wine either in paper bags blind or 10 bottles of wine open on a table at a party. Don't talk about them. Don't label them leave them either in a bag so no one knows what they're drinking or just out with a, you know, uh, you know, in this situation, I would not uh, leave. A and my feeling is, is that the first empty bottle of wine on a table is the best wine on that table. And I don't care if there's a $500 wine on that table and the $5 bottle of wine empties first. This is tense to what happened uh, when the, when the wines are in bags and the, um, uh, when, it, when this is done blind. When it's done blind, what we normally see is that wines between $10 and $30 are the first bottles empty. And a lot of times, very expensive wines do not do as well blind. Now, pull the, pull the labels out of the bottom, and if you can actually see how much these wines cost, people will immediately go for the expensive wine or the wines they recognize. If you see Two Buck Chuck and you see Silver Oak, you might actually prefer the Two Buck Chuck if the wine is blind. Maybe not. But as soon as you pull those bottles out, Charles Shaw is going to be, you know, I almost said the redheaded stepchild, but now my wife has red hair. I have to be very careful. Um, the Charles Shaw might be kind of ignored off to the side, and the Silver Oak is going to get all the attention in the world because people are going to recognize, oh, my gosh, that's a $100 bottle of wine. I better get over there and taste it because it's somebody else's money. Um, and it really does change the way you evaluate wine. If I tell you a wine is $75, here's your $75 wine. Talk to me about it. They even have an MRI at Caltech that watches your brain as they put wine into your mouth. And they have a presentation screen so they can show you a happy face or a sad face, or they can show you $100 or $5, or they can show you in information about the wine. And then they put wine in your mouth through a special tube, and then they watch your brain light up. Big surprise, your brain acts differently if you think you're drinking an expensive wine. Again, if someone tells me I've got a $1,000 wine, a uh, $1,000 wine in my glass, am I going to spend more time sniffing it? Of course I am because, man, I'm going to get $1,000 of pleasure out of that. Someone spent $1,000 of, 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 of their own money on that bottle of wine. Of course I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to taste it a little bit differently. So that's, I think that's going to be pretty important. Flavor-wise, uh, you know, as far as the, uh, the Ballard Lane goes, definitely those big red and black berry fruits, a little bit of kind of uh, a little bit of uh, spice and earth. I mean, I, I normally, you know, these are things that I smell a lot. Classic Paso Robles, uh, more than classic Central Coast. Central Coast Cabernets tend to have a little herbaceousness. Sometimes a little bit of uh, that pyrazine character that might be described as a green bell pepper. I get none of that. I get absolutely zero pyrazine. If you grow the grapes right, the pyrazines and those uh, bell pepper aromas, they shift and they change. And the pyrazines are shifting into terpenes. And they don't always go all the way through. And my idea, and this is my own personal belief, which I'm sure there's probably someone out there that could probably disprove me, is that the pyrazines on their way to terpenes can start showing some intermediate character. They're not quite pyrazine, they're not quite terpene. Like black pepper, white pepper, um, some savory aromas and stuff, they're not quite the aromas of white flowers or terpenes or high, uh, like high tone berry fruit. And they're not quite pyrazine, they're not quite vegetal and they're not quite fruity, they're kind of stuck in between. So my belief is varying amounts of canopy management and opening up the canopy of a grapevine uh, to the to sun and wind 
have a positive effect on, effect on the fruit and the quality of the wine. Uh, and there are varying uh, degrees of leaf removal and sunshine in the canopy that will have varying effects on the fruit. It's not just all the pyrazines gone or all the pyrazines there. Obviously, there's going to be uh, an entire sort of um, continuum. And I think a lot of the things that we smell in wine are really due to uh, fine-tuned canopy management within how a vineyard is managed. Absolutely. Cool enough. Candy's back. Good to see you. I haven't scared you away yet. That's wonderful. Uh, you know you're going to get 30 seconds of Strictly Commercial on the Ballard Lane cab. And then while you guys are still here, I want to tell you what's happening tomorrow because it's going to be kind of a special thing. Um, although you're going to have to deal with me not being here. Um, number one is Ballard Lane Cabernet Sauvignon. It's delicious wine. It got 91 points uh, from uh, the Fair and a gold medal. And it also got a gold medal award uh, from the San Francisco Chronicle, which really is one of the best wine competitions. It's one of the only wine competitions where every wine judge has to be tested and has to be um, educated. Um, Ballard Lane Cabernet Sauvignon 2017, usually on the shelf, $12.99 to $14.99. It is part of the Miller Family Wine Company um, uh, special, stay at home special, let us send you some wine. Uh, I just sent a case of this wine to my dad down in Palm Desert. Tax and shipping included $79 and change. $7.50 a bottle. $7.50 a bottle and uh, one cent shipping. So I don't know how I got that under, under 80 bucks because that should have been a little bit more than that, but it was, it was only $79. It, it'll be amazingly reasonable as far as pricing goes, but we've got nine different wines on the site, everything except Jay Wilkes. So Ballard Lane, Barrel Burner, and Smashberry, especially that Smashberry Rosé. I'll tell you what, $7.50 a bottle for that Smashberry Rosé. You should have at least a couple cases of that waiting for uh, summer, either you being inside in summer or you being outside where you belong in summer. Either way, you're, it's gonna require a Rosé all day, am I right? Um, so uh, the promo code for that is DD50, day drinking DD50, capital D, capital D, five zero. And that'll take, uh, that'll give you 50% off all of the wines. And we are also, just because we love you, we're giving you 20% uh, off any J. Wilkes order mix and match of at least six bottles. But the DD50 um, uh, promo code won't mess up your J. Wilkes wine. So if you want to put some J. Wilkes wines in there, some Ballard Lane, some Barrel Burner, some Smashberry, it all works together. And thank you, Kate, um, who's watching for doing all of the hard work of trying to build and break those promo codes. Um, she did figure out a way to uh, get the price of some of the wines down to zero. Um, I wouldn't share that with you because I love my company as much as I, I love you guys, but it's fixed. You can't get the wine for free anymore and you can't even break it because Katie knows what she's doing. She's got mad skills and Joe and Vince, thanks for coming in as well. All right. So tomorrow, so let's talk a little bit about tomorrow. Tomorrow is we just found out is Kat Cora's birthday. If you don't know who Kat Cora is, she's she uh, won um, the first, uh, the, I think like the first Hell's Kitchen or the first Chopped, uh, the, one of those first, uh, one of those shows. She's the first television made sort of, well, I mean, television made sort of, um, I guess reality show made celebrity chef. And she's awesome. <laughs> She's got an amazing social media uh, out uh, sort of um, a following. And uh, we got a, uh, our uh, PR agency got a request from Kat Cora personally, who said that she was interested in serving Miller Family Wines for her birthday uh, Instagram celebration. It's at Kat Cora, at C-A-T-C-O-R-A. I'm gonna post this all over my social media tomorrow so you guys can join. Just so happens she's going to have her birthday on Instagram at 5 p.m. tomorrow. And as a result of her uh, drinking and enjoying the Miller family wines uh, publicly and on Instagram, I'm gonna support that by watching her. And then, so what we're gonna do is we are going to basically just push the stuff that I was gonna talk about uh, on Friday. Um, 
into the future. So tomorrow I was going to, I think, finish up, um, I think, uh, intro to food and wine pairing. So food and wine pairing might go either uh, to Monday next week or it might uh, just find a time. It might even be as, as late as next Friday. But um, I'm not going anywhere, either of you. So don't worry about it. It'll, we'll have plenty of time to do this. Um, oh, Morgan. Morgan is uh, visiting. Hopefully she's doing well up in, uh, up in Oregon. Morgan was the uh, executive director of the Santa Barbara County Vintners. Um, and uh, while I was on the board, we hired her and she did some excellent, excellent work for her. So I hope everything is well with you, Morgan. Really do miss you. And Marla says the same thing. She says that. And Morgan, by the way, last time I'll be saying this, but we also do this over at the uh, Jay Wilkes Wine Santa Barbara Facebook page. And because it's a commercial page, the quality is a little bit better. And I look at that camera a little bit more than I look at that camera. But I've got two cameras because, you know, I, uh, I'm very lucky that uh, my wife, Chanda, is also my producer. She encourages me to uh, light a candle, um, set this up to make it look a little more homey, and to make sure that um, there's plenty of good books behind me so people can kind of squint and try to understand what is the secret to this Wes Hagen man's brain? What does he read on a regular basis that gives him some skills? Well, it looks like we had a lot of people uh, join us tonight. We're getting more and more people every night. Um, our outreach, you know, within 24 hours is between 1,000 and 2,000 people. So thank you so much for that. Continue to invite your friends to stop by um, every day but Sunday at 5 o'clock. And, um, and think about doing a Facebook uh, watch party. If you liked what you saw and you think your friends will enjoy it, watch it again with one of your Facebook groups. So that's always fun. And, uh, and absolutely. I see a question from Christy. Is it wrong? Oh, okay. And then, oh, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to check questions real quick, and then I will set you guys off to do your uh, day drinking um, individually. All right. 75%. Dominic was correct. Peter got it first. Congratulations. Peter got 75% of any varietal is necessary for a wine to be varietally labeled. Uh, Dominic got it as well. Uh, Michael, I believe 85% is accurate for Oregon and Washington. And then, of course, yes, a Meritage uh, is required to have all five uh, Bordeaux varieties in it. Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, uh, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and or Clavet. Norton can be amazing. Chamberson. Chamberson, I, you know, I, I like Chamberson, and I think Chamberson in Kentucky would be a good, a good idea and much better than mule farming Pinot Noir. No, a $1,000 wine is not uh, 100 times better than a $10 wine, but the people that can afford it don't care. It's sort of, I always say a th $1,000 wine is sort of like an Apple computer. You know, apples are 10% better and they're twice as much. And I'm cool with that. You know, I was an Apple, I, I had an Apple II plus in, in 1983. So don't talk to me about value. That was a fifth, like a 256 K computer. And that was $2,000. If you look at what you pay per, you know, per megabit now, it would have been a thousand, 10,000 times more expensive uh, than anything. I could, I could buy a, a thumb drive with a hundred times more memory than that Apple II plus for, ten dollars as opposed to a two thousand dollar computer so I, I i honestly do think a thousand dollar wine is like it's like an apple computer it's it's a little bit better and for those people that can afford it man i mean drinking the best wines in the world is one of the for me one of the most fun things you can do because it's like it's like traveling the world in a glass <sighs> excellent oh yes and uh, I got a comment that uh, Cheryl and Mark love my, uh, my drinking bear. Let's see, there, there it is, it's right. Let's see, I, I don't know how to do this. Right there, so that, that there is a, is a little puzzle that says Greyhound. And then that, it's actually, it, it does look like a bear, but it's actually a black lab puppy slamming a bottle of Jay Wilkes. And uh, I bought I bought that in uh, I think I bought that in Longmont, Colorado. Um, 
at a very interesting wine shop owned by an Ethiopian man. We had a long discussion about Haile Selassie. Yeah. Is that cultural appropriation? Because I've hung out with so many hippies, white guys with dreads. Maybe, but it was a good conversation. And as a result, I did buy a $30 statue and bring it back for my wife. Because it looked so much like Kestrel, our black lab. It was a wonderful thing. All right, compare scores at the is a home a uh, homemade wine uh, home winemaker tasting. Compare scores. Yeah, so I've judged uh, Iron Chef. Thank you, Janet. That's who Kat Cora won. Um, yeah, she is. She was amazing, and you got that too, Christy. So Bob asks about scores, uh, commercial tasting versus home home wine making scores. Now this is actually really, really, uh, and then I got a question about Viognier, and then we'll close up. Um, I have judged at commercial competitions, and I've judged also at uh, home winemaking competitions. I think certainly uh, to get to gold medal as a home winemaker, it's harder for you as a home winemaker, but we do probably give you a little more dispensation that a gold medal at a commercial competition does need to be a little more expressive than a gold medal at a home wine competition. When I first started judging wine uh, back in the mid 90s, if the wine was good, delicious, and I was proud, to, I would be proud to serve it to my friends, we gave it a gold medal. We would eliminate more than 60% of all wines entered into competition with our nose. Uh, we would uh, call them retain eliminate rounds, and we would put 10 wines in front of us, smell all 10, and push the wines that didn't smell good away, and brought the wines that smelled good closer to us, and then basically eliminated all the wines that smelled like, that didn't smell right, without ever tasting them. And that taught me the letters D-N-P-I-M, which I put in a lot of my notes, which is did not put in mouth. So 20 years ago, half of the wines made in the United States were flawed, were fairly seriously flawed. My belief is in that in 2008, during our first sort of run at this, that uh, basically, that basically, concentrated the, the buying power for the American wine populace into the brands that were making good wine and people stopped spending their money on bad wine because they didn't have the money to spend on it. So I think most winemakers that were making uh, average to bad wine were fired and never came back. And then after 2008, I honestly think, I honestly think that it's a uh, uh, wine and wine quality in this country has improved just in the last 12 years has an increase more than any time in the history of mankind in anywhere, anywhere in the world. We are living in the golden age. Take a $10 wine off any shelf and anywhere in California or anywhere in the United States, chances are it'll be a delicious wine. You just couldn't say that 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So well, how lucky are we that we have so much value and so many options? Um, we had a, a two, uh, two, two quick questions. One was, and hello, Tony. Uh, what, what, and what are my favorite things to pair with Jay Wilkes Viognier? There's something in Viognier that reminds me a lot of cheddar rennet. And you, if you don't know how cheese is made, um, I won't gross you out. But if you really want to know what rennet is, you should look it up because it's in all of your cheese and it's a natural product. Certainly not vegan. You could argue it's probably not even vegetarian because of where it comes from. But rennet is what gives a cheese its character and its flavor. So if you think about uh, the sharpest cheddar you've ever had and that aroma of the sharpness of a good cheddar cheese, that is what the rennet smells like. And Viognier, a lot of Viognier, especially ripe Viognier, tends to have all of these amazing big floral blossomy, perfumey characters that sometimes can hide something I almost always find in Viognier, whether it's, uh, whether it's Gruyere or whether it's uh, Condru or whether it's uh, um, a domestic or an Australian Viognier. I almost always get a little cheddar, that hint of cheddar. So my favorite thing to eat with Viognier is mac and cheese. Like my mac and cheese, fresh elbow macaroni, heavy whipping cream, half a stick of butter, four pieces of Kraft American slices, and then basically just like, probably like um, 
uh, Cabot extra vintage white cheddar, like another big, like two handfuls. So it's like so cheesy that it just, it's ridiculous. You, you ask yourself the question, could you make this any creamier or cheesier? And the answer is no. That's what I would have with that Viognier. But the Viognier um, also I think would be delicious with something like um, lobster mitts with dirty rice and a little bit of like sherry reduction. Um, Viognier is also an excellent uh, session wine, excellent uh, summer sipping wine. No reason you can't just drink it. Tim Vandergrift, how are you, Timmy? And I saw Curtis came on too. So lovely to have all you guys here. If you don't know, um, Tim, Tim is my friend up in uh, White, I think White Rock, British Columbia, the Banana Belt, the Banana Belt of British Columbia. He um, he's the man who taught me to drink beer. I mean, my dad was the guy who taught me to drink beer. I stole one of my dad's Coors tall boys when I was three years old and drank the whole damn thing and puttered around our backyard in Eagle Rock, California, just going. I, I, he said I held my buzz. I didn't get sick. Yes. Three year old drink with 18 ounces of beer. I had fun, but I knew how to, I, I knew how to hold my buzz. I know someone who thinks wine and cheese don't go together. Well, you know, I also know some people, Science is important to getting ourselves out of a out of a pandemic. So, you know, there's always someone who's going to be silly. Um, but uh, Tim, miss you. I hope everything's well in Canada. Uh, miss all you f wonderful folks in Canada. No one says sorry like you guys. So we appreciate that. I will go through if you guys have any other questions about the uh, Ballard Lane Cabernet Sauvignon that we tasted today, 2017. Let me know. I will also post my calendar for what we're going to be talking around about the next couple weeks on these wonderful five o'clock tastings. I'm feeling really good about them. I'm feeling great that we're increasing our uh, viewership. Uh, please do encourage uh, your friends and family to tune in with or without you. Um, make viewing parties. All that good stuff is absolutely wonderful. And uh, we will be watching Kat Cora doing her thing uh, tomorrow at five o'clock for her birthday, drinking the same wines that uh, you have the opportunity uh, to purchase. Again, MillerFamilyWines.com. Promo code is capital D, capital D for day drinking 50. 50 is 50% 50 off all non-J Wilkes wines. And we are putting together some big special for you guys for next week to funnel this all into the J Wilkes world. Um, but I would definitely recommend jumping in on that 50% uh, off all of the Miller Family Wines from Ballard Lane, Barrel Burner and Smashberry. And if it was up to me, I would be looking at the Ballard Lane, Zinfandel, the Smashberry Rosé, and maybe some uh, some of that Sauvignon Blanc from Ballard Lane too. Barrel Burner, Chard, and Cab are, are wonderful as well. That's all I have for you tonight. I am basically going to be off um, videos now until Saturday. So I get my uh, Friday off to watch Cat Core's birthday party and hang out and party with Cat, get our kitty on, and uh, I will sit here for a little bit longer and uh, enjoy this wonderful Ballard Lane uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and welcome, uh, welcome Rick. And Beth is back, so lovely. It's, uh, it's about 5.40, Tuesdays and Thursdays are usually our short shows. They usually run about half hour, 45 minutes. And then the Monday, Wednesdays and Friday shows usually ended up going a little bit long. I'm always on, I try to be on at 4.50 every day just to get my camera set up, but that also gives you the chance if you want a little sort of one-on-one -on -one time or time to ask me a question that might not be a good time to do it while we're all here together. 4.50, I'm usually on, usually by you know five minutes before, um, I'll have the feeds up so you can see where they are. And uh, other than that, geez, I uh, really look forward to spending some time with you guys next week and on Saturday. So I'll see you Saturday at five for our hangout and drink session. I have no agenda and I do not drink Miller Family Wines on Saturday. I drink everything but. I might be drinking Tobola Mezcal. I might be drinking some Scotch whiskey, uh, some Japanese whiskey. Who knows? I might be drinking beer. Chances are I'm going to probably be drinking beer. All right. Thank you, Tanino. Really appreciate that. And congratulations on your proper spelling of Restaurateur. You win a corkscrew at some point. Also, if you do and you if you do order uh, a case of any of the wines on our website and you haven't emailed me at whagan at jwilks.com, 
please do and let me know your address. I will send you a personal note and a corkscrew. I have yet to send any out so far, but I do have that on my agenda for early next week. So that would be a perfect time for you to buy some wine, send me your address, I'll send you a corkscrew, even if you bought wine that is under a screw cap. Cool. Well, I hope you guys all had fun, learned something about Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, learned something about the history of wine, learned something about the history of lenses, the history of the microscope, the history of, uh, of the telescope, and just how important wine, science, and culture are. So, awesome. Perfect, perfect. So I really wanna make sure you guys realize um, that uh, we're here for you. If you have any questions about the wines or uh, pricing discounts or anything, just send me an email at whagan at jwilkes.com. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Janet figured out that my pricing on the wine that I sent to my dad was a little bit lower because I got employee pricing that you guys would probably spend uh, instead of my price, you guys would probably be about just under $100 a case uh, on average, anywhere you send it, anywhere in the United States. So think about that, do consider it, and uh, it's wonderful spending some time with you. And uh, if you missed any of this, I hope you go back and check it out. If you have anything you want me to talk about, any questions about wine, post them, let me know, send me an email, let me know how I can make this more meaningful to you and people that are watching it, and I'll do everything I can. Other than that, I'm gonna just be sitting here, day drinking while there's still a little light outside. I wanna make sure that you see on uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy behind me to show not only I am a, a fan of Douglas Adams, but I am still day drinking. Thank you all for being here. An absolute, uh, I am not the winemaker for all of the Miller family wines. I uh, Thank you, Kirk. That was something I wanted to address. I am the winemaker for Jay Wilkes wines and the brand ambassador for all of the wines that are made under the Miller family wine uh, company. Um, so Ballard Lane, Barrel Burner and Smashberry are brands that I represent and brands that I help promote and sell. And then the Jay Wilkes wines, I am given the charge by the Miller Family Wine Company to be the winemaker for those wines and to uh, be in charge of their production. So I would say that the Jay Wilkes wines are under uh, under my sort of um, under my thumb, I guess, and all the other wines are my responsibility to promote, but not wines that I make. But wines I love to drink. Good news. Also, uh, that's about it. I think uh, I hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful evening. Don't don't forget to drink a bunch of delicious Santa Barbara wines, and uh, Paso Robles wines, and Central Coast wines. And know that I will be back as long as I am able to hang out with you guys at five o'clock on every day except Sunday. And tomorrow we will watch Cat Cora's birthday together. Looking forward to it. Hope you guys all have a wonderful evening. Thanks again, and remember. Wine is an investment to keep the people you love at table for an extra hour every day. <laughs>